Well, it's good to see every one of you, and if you turn your Bibles with me to the book of 1 Samuel chapter 16, uh, we are starting a series on the life of David, and it's entitled Ups and Downs. And the idea behind the title of it is that you're going to see a lot of ups and downs in David's life, but we're also going to witness the faithfulness and grace of God in David's life. And I began to think about my own life, and I'm like, man, I can totally relate to the whole idea of ups and downs. I wish I could tell you that my spiritual journey has been up and to the right and just one steady line, but my journey has uh, included ups and downs, but I can also celebrate God's faithfulness. So today, we're going to take a a look at uh, the heart of David and the power of, of worship. And so if you stand with me, I'm going to begin reading at verse 13 where uh, we left off last week and uh, the prophet Samuel was anointing David for the future job of being the king of Israel. And so he's standing there with some other people and it's kind of a ceremony of sorts. So verse 13, so David took, David stood there among his brothers and Samuel took the flask of olive oil he had brought and anointed David with oil. And the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David from that day on. Verse 14, Now the Spirit of the Lord had left Saul, and the Lord sent a tormenting spirit that filled him with depression and fear. Some of Saul's servants said to him, A tormenting spirit from God is troubling you. Let us find a good musician and play the, to play the harp, Whenever the tormenting spirit troubles you, and he will play soothing music, and you will soon, you will soon be well again. All right, Saul said, find someone who plays well. Not someone who plays bad. Someone who plays well, and bring him here. And one of the servants said to Saul, one of Jesse's sons from Bethlehem is a talented harp player. Not only that, but he's a brave warrior, a man of war. He has good judgment. He is also a fine-looking young man, and the Lord is with him. And so Saul sent messengers to Jesse to say, Send me your son David, the shepherd. Jesse responded by sending David to Saul, along with a young goat, a donkey loaded with bread, and wineskins full of wine. And so David went to Saul and began serving him, and Saul loved David very much. And David became his armor-bearer. And then Saul, went, then Saul sent word to Jesse asking, please, let David remain in my service, for I am very pleased with him. And whenever the tormenting spirit from God troubled Saul, David would play the harp, and then Saul would feel better, and the tormenting spirit would go away. This is God's word. So I remember uh, just recently hearing a guy tell a little bit about something from his life, and I started laughing out loud because I, I had to uh, just laugh because I could relate to it very much. He said, I'm going to be real transparent with you. I love my life right now. I love my life right now. I love just what's happening. I think about my past and where God has brought me, and I think about all the experiences that God has given me. I think about my family. I think about this. I think about that. I love my life. And sometimes I say to God, I can't believe this is my life. He said, but then... There are days when I experience pressure and problems and there's haters out there and there's just all kinds of stuff that's happening and I'm dealing with all kinds of stress and then I come home and I got to take out the garbage and I I say to God, I can't believe this is my life. And then he said, one is called Tuesday and one is called Wednesday. Wednesday. Isn't it funny how life can be that way? I mean, one day, you're just on top of the world. I mean, things couldn't be better. You're in tears of how great life is. And then within 24 hours, you think the world, you're like Chicken Little. You think the world is caved in and all over on top of you. And I can totally relate to that. I get that. And so today, I want to talk about the power of worship. I want to talk about how worship can be powerful in your life. If you notice with verse 13 and then verse 14, it's obvious that the Bible put Saul and David side by side. He juxtaposed them so that we could see a very stark contrast with these two guys. And both in their accounts had ups and down 
But one guy, David, was described as a man after God's own heart, while the other guy is an example of what not to do, for the most part. And so, again, I ask the question, what's the deal with David? What's about David? And so I'm just going to, unpack, as I unpack this series, today we're going to see that David was a worshiper of God. And specifically, he was thankful and he praised God in worship. And so as we get started, I'm going to warn you, this is going to be a tough sermon. I'm going to step on some toes. And you're going to think I've gone from preaching to meddling and stuff like that. But hey, I'm just going verse by verse through this. And it's designed to be a blessing. The whole goal of this message is for God to um, give you power and for his presence to become more and more real in your life. So when you start getting mad at me in a minute here, just know my heart is good. I mean well. And uh, it is God's will for, for all of us to hear the full word of God. So I'll start with Saul, and that's going to be challenging. Then I'm going to get to David. That's going to be challenging. And then I'm going to talk about your work life. And that's going to be really challenging. So verses 13 through 14, David was anointed with oil. We just read that. And the Spirit came powerfully upon him for the remainder of his life. That's what the Bible says. Then in the next verse, it says, The Spirit of the Lord left Saul, and the Lord sent a tormenting spirit or an evil spirit that filled Saul with depression and fear. Now, most people, when they see or hear that, they're like, what? God sent an evil spirit to torment something, somebody? Or how can God, or can God take away his spirit from me? Will God, like, leave my life? I mean, is God that way? And so I want to talk about that because those are valid questions. And the answer will answer both of them at the same time. You know this, right? Love sometimes is tender. But love also must be tough. Those of you who are parents or those of you who are grandparents, you know this. If you're too soft and you're too tender and you don't instill discipline and toughness in, in their lives, then you're going to have problems. But you can have the flip side of that as well. You can be so tough and you don't have the heartstrings of tenderness that you, you have your own set of problems. And so there's a balance and every, ki- every child has you know, their own personality and you've got to figure out how tough and how tender and that sort of thing with the child. And so with that in mind, this is a passage of Scripture where God is being tough. He has to be tough for the sake of Saul. And so God's taking measures to allow an evil spirit to torment Saul, not because he gets his jollies and seeing that happen, but the whole goal is that Saul would experience what life is like apart from him, and he would repent, he would change his ways and do a 180 degree turn and go the opposite direction back to God. Sometimes God has to allow your life to become hell so that he can save you from from your soul from hell in the first place. When people go their own way and they don't want to pursue God and seek God's heart in matters like this, basically they're saying, God, I want to do it my way. And the worst thing that God can say to you is, okay, since you are so bent and you're so determined and you think you know this is the right way to go, have it your own way. I'm going to let you do that because apparently your heart isn't soft enough to to listen to where I want you to go. And so he will allow you to suffer the natural consequences of being in total charge of your own life and making your own decisions, and he will allow your self-will to go far enough where he will allow you to experience what this world and the invisible forces of this world will provide for you. An example in the New Testament is in 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 the church of Corinth. And they had a guy in that particular church, and he was involved in a life-dominating sin. And he would not repent of it. And the church was too chicken to confront him about it. And I don't know why they weren't confronting about it, but some of them even thought it was okay. And so it was a real mess. And so Paul, when he wrote to those guys, said, hey, you got to take care of this problem. And he said this in 1 Corinthians 5.5. He says, 
hand him over to Satan. Hand him over to Satan so that his sinful nature will be destroyed and he himself will be saved on the day that the Lord returns. Turn him over to Satan. Let him experience the devil as his friend and his master and just see what kind of a friend, what kind of a master the devil really is. Now, some of you are going, oh, no, I mean, I wouldn't be that bad. But here's the deal. The Bible says either Christ is your master, either God is in control of your life, or the devil is in control of your life. There is no middle ground. We like to think that we can stand on one chair and another chair, and we can kind of straddle it. But the problem is like a boat on a dock. It starts drifting out. And I, you, can, you can do the split so far, but you can only go so far. And God will allow that drift to take place in your life, and then you will experience the full effect of living life on your own, separated from God. It's very, very sobering, very challenging, isn't it? If you read the Second Corinthians, though, thank the Lord, it records that that young man, he played with the devil for a while, and he repented, and Paul says, cheerfully receive this guy back. Bring him back into your fellowship. He has learned his lesson. And so sometimes God will allow a person's life to become hell so he can save their life from hell. And Jesus described hell as a place of darkness, torment, and regret. That's the same kind of words that the Bible describes what was happening to Saul. He was allowing Saul to experience the natural consequences of saying, I want to do it my way. I don't need God to show me. Or what we do is we con ourselves into thinking it's okay with God, but we haven't done any of the due diligence to really pursue God's heart, to pursue counsel from other godly people, to really confirm that it's from God. We just we kind of smear some religious mixed lipstick on our own ideas, and we go forward. And then, as a pastor, I've see, seen this over 20 years. They come back to me and go, I can't believe God let me do this. I can't believe God would do this in my life. And I'm just like, what? What did God do? You did everything. You're happy to be in charge of your life. You're dealing with the consequences. You're not bearing your cross. You're reaping your crop, as my African-American pastors would say. And so, but the good news is that even on the road of destruction, and people are going their own way, this baby right here is planted on the road of destruction. God has placed the cross of Christ to block the way to destruction. And when a person can come to themselves, as they open themselves back up to God, and they begin to understand what's going on, their eyes are open, the cool thing is right smack in front of them is the cross of Christ, that all the sins and all the wrongs have been covered by, the, by what Christ did upon the cross, and his nail-scarred hands are wide open, and like that prodigal son story, he welcomes us back into his arms. But, and I tell you, man, I've seen this happen. When people have been playing with the devil, and they really get a full taste, they drink deep of everything this great world has to offer them, they come up empty, and they're like, I don't want any of this stuff. And when they get the real deal, they start drinking living water again. The, the presence and the power and the love and the grace of God. And they're like, I never, ever want to return to that. And so true repentance will lead to a more devoted and grateful heart. And sometimes God will allow a person's life to become hell. And that's basically what's happening with Saul. Now, I'm just a little side note on those of you who, um, because we love people in our church, we've done this ever since the beginning, some people, they're like really shocked. Even though we go over this in new members class, we talk about it quite frequently. We practice what is called church restoration, church discipline. If we have a member of our church who has come into our body and says, I want to grow in Christ. I want to live in community with this body. I want your help and I want to be a help in your life so that we can all follow Christ devotedly. And then that person, for whatever reason, starts going off the, off, offline. We're going to come and, and chase them down and say, hey, what's going on? Help me understand. And usually it goes one of two ways. They get really mad and they call us judgmental and it's none of your business and all that kind of stuff. Or they go, thank you. I don't know what to do. I just, I have no, I had no idea I was so far off. And they come back and, oh, it's just been awesome. But it's one of two ways. But that's the way our hearts are. Either our hearts are really moving towards God or our hearts are not. They're moving away from God. 
And so God will allow circumstances to push you into a place where you realize, okay, where's my heart? Is my heart really God's or is my heart really, I want the world and I want to smear a little bit of religious lipstick on it to satisfy my own guilty conscience when I know that what I am pursuing is not right. I told you this is going to be a tough one, but it's the truth. So verses 15 through 17 Uh, One of the servants told Saul that a tormenting spirit from God was troubling him. Isn't that funny? Everybody in the room knew what was going on except Saul. He would, I mean, the clue phone had been ringing and ringing and ringing. Some of the servants already answered, yep, yep, we know. He's not following God. Nope, he's backslid. Nope, he's not doing what he used to do at first. Nope, he's not excited about the Lord like he was. Nope, he's not prophesying like he did with those prophets earlier in chapter 10. Nope, he's not, he doesn't have a passion for the things of God. Nope. Saul don't get it. He doesn't, he's not answering the clue phone. And so it appeared that everyone in the room was aware that Saul's spiritual decline, except Saul. But isn't that the way life works? That's why they have these things called interventions. Because sometimes a person gets so caught up in their own darkness that they can't see it. I mean, it, they just can't see it. And I understand that. I totally get that. I can say this without judgment whatsoever. I understand this. And this is another reason why Christians need other Christians. We need Christian community, especially a good, holistic, small group where, man, I pray that our small groups can get to a place where it can be safe enough and we hunger for God enough where everyone in that group can say, hey, is there anything in my life right now? Do you guys see any red flags in my life right now? And they can actually say, well... Actually, um, yeah, I'm a little bit concerned about this. And then they say, okay, tell me more. You see, if you want to grow spiritually, if you want to experience the power of God, this is the way to do it. It takes courage and it takes maturity, but this will kick your spiritual maturity in overdrive. It will send you into higher gear because what is keeping you from growing in Christ is probably some kind of weight or some kind of sin, as Hebrews 12 says. And the groups are there to kind of help because we don't see it. We don't see it. And so one of Saul's servants said, hey, let's find a musician, someone who can play some soothing music. And uh, back then, just... One of, my, one of my study guides said that, you know, archaeological records and carvings, basically the guys back then believed that music soothed passions. It, it soothes the savage beast kind of thing. Uh, they believed that, that soothing music healed mental diseases. They believed that it held riots in check. And so uh, music was, was very powerful to them back then. Music's powerful today, isn't it? No, I'm, I'm just, I almost went on a tangent, and you just watched me stop. I can do that sometimes. The spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet. I, I did it. But ask me later about music and the power of music and, and just what the kind of music that's out there and music in our lives and whoa. Think it through. It'll make a lot of sense. Uh, verse 18, so someone knew David played the harp, which was a cool instrument back then. And it's a cool instrument now, but it's more like, well, it's kind of like what the guitar is today. The harp was kind of like that back then. And so the servant David said, the servant said David was talented, not only that, but he was a brave warrior. He had good judgment, and the Lord was with him. In other words, this guy has right now in his life what you don't have. You ever catch that? I mean, you can't tell the king that he's wrong, But sometimes you can draw their attention to things that are right by saying, yeah, he's, the Lord's with him. Remember how we just said you had a tormenting spirit from God? You shouldn't be okay with that. That should bother you. So anyways, that was kind of probably his way. That's what I thought it was. God was showing Saul what he was missing as David was being described in front of him. You know, basically God was saying, you know, you could have that again. I'm very happy to put my hand upon you again. I am very happy to make you brave. I am very happy to have you stand up for justice again and to care about your people and to care about me and my ways. 
I believe that with all my heart. But Saul's heart was so determined to go his own way. And um, so verse 23, it says that the tormenting spirit that troubled Saul uh, would come. David would pull out his harp, and he would begin playing the music. And with Saul's spirit, uh, with, with the spirit of uh, God upon David, the tormenting spirit would go away, and Saul would feel better. So here's the question, the question of the morning. Could this be true today? Could this be true today? Could God give you this kind of power, this kind of worship, where this kind of results take place, where evil spirits literally flee, where darkness and madness and depression and fear, it all takes flight? What would happen if it were true? It is true. That's what I'm telling you. That's why this is a big, stinking, hairy deal. This is true. Praising God in worship is like lighting a match. You're in your darkness. You begin to thank God. You begin to praise Him. And light appears. I wasn't going to have everybody turn the shades down and lights off and that sort of thing. You get the idea, don't you? Lighting a match like worship, praising God. See, it, praising God in darkness is a vehicle of faith which brings us into the presence and the power of God. When you thank what God has done in your past, that's called thanksgiving. When you thank God for what has not yet happened, that's called faith. That's called praise. That's called thanksgiving. And I have seen firsthand with people who battle with depression and dark moods and what we're about to talk about today transformed their life. It's awesome. So when we praise God, when we thank God and we praise God in worship, two things happen. You experience his presence and you experience his power. In Psalm 22 verse 3, I love how the King James says it. It says that God inhabits the praises of his people. God inhabits the praises, or he's enthroned on the praises of his people. When we praise God, we, are, we experience the throne room of God. We experience his presence in our life. Now, some people say that God's far away, and, and I just, I, I just, he just seems so far away. Praise him. Praise him. Worship him. It's the right thing to do no matter how you feel. You don't have to feel his presence. It's still the right thing to do because he is worthy of our praise. It ain't about your feelings. It ain't about how you are or not. It's about him. It's about his glory, and he is worthy of praise. The side benefit is you do that long enough, you do that regularly, you do that from the guts, from the bottom of your feet, and you practice it, and you practice it, and practice it, you will experience the presence of God. I promise you. You will. The second thing is power. In Acts chapter 16, Paul and Silas, they had been witnessing in, in the city of Philippi, and they got arrested, and they were beaten severely. And they were thrown in prison. They're shack, they had their feet shackled. And so they're in darkness. They're in gloom. They were beaten up. They were sore. Things are looking really bad. And the Bible says in Acts chapter 16, verses 24 and 25, look what it says. So the sailor put, the sailor, the jailer, the jailer, that's a, never mind. The jailer put them into the inner dungeons and clamped their feet with stocks. Around midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening. And to go on, the story says that as Paul and Silas began to pray and sing to God, then God moved in power with a literal earthquake. And that night, a jailer and his whole family and his, all of his household servants with joy in their heart and relief, they praised God. They received Christ that night. I doubt if Paul and, if Paul and Silas couldn't even imagine something like that would happen. But they didn't know. They, they were just in a moment. They were in the darkness. They lit a match. 
And with that match, it chased away the darkness, and boy, did God work. All those people in the prison were listening. I mean, God received incredible glory as, we, as they praised him. It's been said this about praise and worship, is that when you thank and praise God in worship, when circumstances get worse, and they usually do, when your faith is being tested, your circumstances will get worse before they get better. When you thank and praise God in worship, when your circumstances get worse, you get better. You get stronger and stronger and stronger. Thanking and praising God will, keep you, will not keep you from trouble. We'd like to think that, okay, if I can get all my spiritual dials just right, then I won't have any problems. I'll, have this, I'll be like living on the serene little lake, Lake Placid is where I want to be. And, but God never promised that. He says, in this world, you'll have trouble. So thanking, praising God won't keep you from trouble, but it will strengthen you when you are in trouble. It won't keep you from trouble, but it'll strengthen you when you're in trouble. In great power, God inhabits the praises of his people, and you were made to worship God. And when you worship him, you will experience his presence and his power. Why is worship so powerful? It chases away the darkness. So why was David so successful? This, it, this is like actually the best part of the sermon, so stay with me. This is really good. Why was David so successful? Why did the evil spirits depart? I believe the Bible says that he was successful because who this guy was in private is what came out when he was in public. See, David was a thankful man in private. David was a worshipful man in private. And as he thanked and praised God when he was alone, watching sheep on a hillside, or, when, or as he headed into a courtroom, or not court, a throne room with a crazy guy, a madman, God's power was on display. David dressed right before he got into his toxic environment. And because of my time, I won't try to put this on, but what I have here is uh, my bee suit. Some of you know I keep bees, and I, uh, I have some new bees that I got last, last summer because my other bees didn't make it through the winters previously, and I got these from Terre Haute, Terre Haute. but I call these my Terror Haute bees because these are mean <laughs> bees. I mean, these are aggressive little guys, gals, excuse me. And the old saying is, the meaner the bee, the more honey you get. And, and so I'm like, okay, I guess I got some mean bees. I hope I get some more honey, but I can't tend these bees unless I get some serious protection. So I ordered that thing, and I zip that thing up, and I make sure every little crevice is covered because they'll find a way to get you. And so I put on that bee suit to deal with my terror hope bees. And if I have proper covering, if I have proper covering, then I'm fine. I can work with them, and I can do what I, I do, and that sort of thing, and I'm fine. No problems whatsoever. Uh, here's, here's the deal. David, before he put on his work clothes, put on his garment of praise first. And so he went in there, and he, with the right kind of work clothes, he dealt with in a very dark place. So here's the deal. If you have the right kind of clothes on... Right? Like my bee suit, or even more, like one of these contamination suits, you can work with anthrax. You can work in an environment that produces anthrax or sarin gas or whatever, and you can be fine. But what I have noticed with Christians is that when they go to work, I'm hearing more of a, hey, pray for me at work because there's a lot of negativity, there's a lot of darkness, and it's really getting to me. I find myself compromising. I found myself standing there with them and complaining about stuff. And I'm not hearing, hey, praise God. I went to work, and because of the overflow of my thanksgiving and my praise in my own heart, because I had the garment of praise on here, my light like shone and all the darkness went away. Is that your observation? Yeah, and so I think that's really challenging. I think it's good. And so I think God wants to give you the right kind of work clothes to put on before you, get, you put on your work clothes, a contamination suit that will protect you from the darkness and the toxic, toxic, toxicity of the environment. So let's talk about that as I wind this thing down. 
Um, in Psalm 100, verse 4, it shows us how to develop and cultivate a heart that praises God. And I believe as you praise God, so the power in his presence will come. In Psalm 100, verse 4, it says, Enter his gates with thanksgiving, go into his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. You see, geographically or logistically, you have this gate. And so this is the outer part. You enter into the gate of thanksgiving, with thanksgiving. Then you go further, closer to God, into his courts with praise. So you begin your day, or at the end of your day, before you go to bed and you're getting ready to go get up for work the next morning, whether you're a morning person or a late night person, you just do it. You're just like, all right, I'm going to start thanking God for stuff right here. I'm going to thank him for what he has done. Because when we get caught up in the toxic stuff and we get infected, we just see all the negative, all the wrong, all that's wrong, all this should be better, you know, that sort of thing. And so when you enter into Thanksgiving, you're thanking God for what he's done. And then you go in further, and as you begin to praise, you begin thanking God for who he is, for who he is. And so Hebrews 4, verse 6 says, Let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God, and there you will receive his mercy and find his grace to help you when you need him the most. So if you can get to his throne, you will receive mercy and grace, and he'll help you with whatever need you have. But apparently, to be in a good place for, to hear him and to follow him, you need to prepare your heart. And so God's saying, hey, my door is wide open. I mean, you don't have to try to like, kick my door in. I'm here. I'm waiting for you. But we just kind of go in there, oh, man, Lord, I hate this. I hate that. Take care of that. Take care of that. And we are just like, we, just, we try to bring that toxicity into God's presence. And God said, whoa, you've got to decontaminate yourself. And so you enter the first contamin- decontamination ch- chamber, and you, you start praising God, or thanking God. Thank you, God. Thank you for this. Thank you for that. And, I mean, as you practice this, you should be able to pop off 10 in less than 30 seconds. I was almost going to have a thing where you, like, lit a match and, like, see if you can get 10 off before you burned your fingers. But I thought, you know, that's a little bit cruel, and that's probably not a good way of doing it. And so that's not a homework assignment. But, hey, we should be able to pop off 10 in like less than 30 seconds as we practice this. And so as we get warmed up, we get closer to God, we enter his courts by praising him for who he is. And so if you're not a Christ follower here today, um, what I'm talking about is probably going to sound a little bit strange to you. But when a person becomes a Christian, when they give their life to Christ, their hearts are going to be filled with joy because they're finally free from the burden of their sin, and now they have the love of the Lord. And if you'd like to talk to me more about that, I'd be happy to talk to you after church about that. But to those of you who are Christ followers here today, here's a couple questions. Don't get mad at me. I'm just doing my job. On a scale of 1 to 10, how thankful and worshipful are you right now? Right now in your life? How contaminated are you? Scale 1 to 10. How thankful and worshipful are you these days? And if someone were trying to find a worshiper or a God, hey, let's find someone who's like really positive and joyful and is really excited about God. Let's get them over here so we can ask them some questions. Would they think of you as that person? I mean, David, he had a rep already. Would you be that person? Or they'd say, oh, no, he's just like everyone else. He just goes to church, though. But he's just as negative as everybody else. What would they think about you? And so when you leave the privacy of where you live, what kind of a spirit do you take into the public place? Does your life exhibit thanksgiving and praise and joy and mercy and grace because you spent time at the throne? And you have the presence and the power of God. You've got the garment of praise. You have your contamination suit. You're ready to work with anthrax all day long. And you're fine. In fact, the darkness won't encroach on you. You will push it away. Think about it. If we really took this to our hearts, just think about it. It gives me goosebumps. It's awesome. I believe that if you ask God, 
he would be very, very happy to anoint you with his Holy Spirit in a fresh way today. Just like that very day when David was standing there with Samuel and his brothers and his dad and whoever else was around. I believe that God would be very happy to give you a fresh anointing. You, want, you need to want it, though. You need to ask him for it. And so we're going to ask in a minute. Too many Christians are getting contaminated and they're not expelling that darkness. But I believe that God can turn it around. I think that we can be a different kind of people. I think we can radiate and give God glory as we leave this place today where we end up going. I think we can be like what the psalmist says in Psalm 89, verse 15. Happy are those who hear the joyful call to worship. Happy are those who hear the joyful call to worship, for they will walk in the light of your presence, Lord. Why is worship so important? Why is worship so powerful? Oh, man. Because you get to walk in the light of God's presence and you expel. You will see darkness expelled. So I think we got some repenting to do. At least I do. And so I'm just going to open it up right now. And I'm just going to pray for anybody here today. Just close your eyes if you would. If, if, you're, if you're just like, man, you totally nailed me. I didn't nail you. God is speaking to your heart. It's for your good. If you would like prayer in this area because you realize I don't even want to give you my number from 1 to 10. I would like to pray for you. And if you are brave enough, would you, with everybody's eyes closed, would you just raise your hand and just say, yeah, please pray for me. Please pray for me. Yeah, please pray. I see. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I knew this was going to be relevant. This, this, is, this is what we deal with every day. So Lord, I want to thank you that you are worthy of our praise no matter how we feel. I am so thankful that we don't have to become like Saul's where we are just tormented in darkness and fear because of a hardness of heart. Instead, Lord, you can cultivate a new heart within us. You can give us a new heart. And so as David confessed his sin in, in, in one of the Psalms, he said, Lord, give me a new heart. Don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Lord, we don't want to walk away from you. We don't want to do anything that would endanger our relationship with you. Lord, we want our relationship to be like, like, um, like a kid that grows up in a, in, a, in a house and they move out and they want to, be, they want to come back to the house. They want to enjoy the, the presence of their father or their mother. And Lord, we don't want to live a life of duty. We don't want this sermon to be, a, okay, I got to try harder. You just want us to open our eyes and see how great you are. And so, Lord, I just pray you do that. Just help us to see ourselves for who we really are and help us to see you for who you really are. And I pray, Lord, that in the light of your glory and grace, we pray that you would give us a new perspective and may we be people who just can't help but just being thankful. And then we just look at you and go, wow, your love is unfailing. Oh, God, you are so good. Oh, God, you are so merciful. You're so gracious. You're so kind. Lord, you're tough and you're hard, but you're so good. I praise you. You're severe. You're frightening. You're good. You're tender. Oh, God, you're just, you're just beyond what I can even imagine. Thank you, God. I just pray that you meet us in a new way. Pour out your spirit upon us and give us fresh, fresh life. And I ask this, Jesus, in your name. Amen.